I would like uh, to go more into detail into um, a success, success story how we from MobileDE managed to change our very bespoke legacy architecture that has different flaws and different constraints to a new flexible approach that is, supports us now in business growth. And I hope you can all take some, something with you from this presentation. And I'm always open to questions if you have them afterwards. So who is MobileDE? It's, we are the biggest portal for home and living in Germany. Uh, we have a click-out, lead-based revenue mo model. Currently, we are engaged in the markets Germany and France, but there are more countries to come soon. Um, we are listing, alone in Germany, over 250 partners with five, uh, 4 point five million active products. Um, and in 2018, we had over 50 million visits on our portal and mobile applications. And what is very distinguishable for our business model, we have a flexible pricing that enables the partner that's working with us to bid the way he or she wants to, to make the best revenue for the marketing campaigns. Um, who am I? I'm Christian. I'm 34 years old, Hamburg-based. I'm uh, in the digital business over 10 years on consulting side, on client side. It's quite boring. If you, can, if you want, you can connect. Um, and if you have questions, you can write. So what we did in 2018, we migrated our legacy system to a mobile-friendly and microservice-based new future-proven system. This is quite a nice picture. It took uh, one of my designers quite a long to find uh, an image that suits our legacy system. Um, it was a monolith, to be honest. And we only kept building on top, on top, on top, on top. There was a solid base, but we were not able to change anything that is below the top. So what we did, build on, build on, build on, and hope that nothing crashes. Whoever finds itself, finds this in his own company, uh, you might smile. But this has different constraints that we had to take and we had to engage. We had some business specialities uh, and we had IT constraints that were hindering them. For example, we had an over average mobile share of traffic. Um, everybody yells mobile first, mobile only, but quite this, this poses a problem as well, and I can tell you on later why. Uh, we are in a competitive market, and there are other players attacking our business model, um, working with our partners. This leads to the topic we needed fast pace, flexibility to roll out new software, to roll out fast and often. And we were a test-driven and are a test-driven and um, decision-making company. And on the other side, the IT was not supporting us. We had a monolithic architecture. It was highly bespoke. So it was hard to find people who could maintain it uh, or who are willing to maintain it. Uh, we had long deployment uh, cycles. We had no mo mobile-first strategy or template. We had performance bottlenecks because we kept building, building, building. And um, we had an outsourced development, that not in-house in, in Hamburg, uh, but we were working with, uh, with an Indian company. Uh, and this is another problem that we had to solve. And in the end, that boils down to the topic business and IT were not speaking the same language. IT was building features, business was describing value, but nobody translated this. So we saw it was obvious that we cannot gain any future growth or stability in, with this setup, and we need to change them. And with this IT setup, we need to change our organizational setup as well from this outsourced development, very waterfall, very long-lasting cycles, to a more agile approach. And it was agreed we set some goals for this project. Why? Because we want to measure, are we successful or are we not successful? First of all, biggest goal was performance. So we wanted to increase the website performance with the time to load and time to fully interactive, to be below our competitors and to be below best practice in the market. This was our target. 
be the fastest there. We are not quite there, but we are on a good way. Mobile first, yes. We I have a mobile first strategy. We have, we have an over average mobile share of traffic. We want to support these users, but of course, by, we want to support them, but still do not forget the desktop or the tablet traffic because we want to bring, bring it back to a market average share of mobile and desktop traffic. This is just because, uh, if you can imagine, in the furniture business, mobile traffic is good for customer awareness, for showing your brand, for showing the product, but the real conversion most times takes place on the desktop. Um, that's why we had to fix this issue as well. We wanted to have good quality, deliver high quality product and deliver it fast. Um, this it's hard to achieve with an Indian development partner. Uh, we wanted to be flexible again, to try often, fail fast, to rely on data and to try. And this we were not. We wanted to increase the development speed to release often small iterations and get rid of these big bangs that are always painful. If you ever had a big bang relaunch, you don't want to do it again. And the last but not the least is to have control back in-house, to have control over quality, deployment processes, alignment processes, to have it all in our hands again. So what we learned in this phase of the project Know what drives your business and what are your obstacles, because I think most of you already heard this from some people in your companies, um, that IT is blocking the business, IT is not doing well, it's not fast enough, it's not good enough, quality is not sufficient, but in the end, that does not help. You have to know what are the obstacles. Name them clearly, write them down, show them to everybody, and show a way and show a target picture where you want to be, and then you can show the way. But just saying, nah, it's not working, nobody's helped. And clearly define the project aims. If you don't do this, you can't be able to measure success, or if there's no success, to stop a project. So what we did, we set together business and IT, development, marketing, and, for, and so on. And we decided we want to go from this monolith on this side to a microservice-based target architecture. You all know the benefits of microservices. You all know the flaws of microservices, I think. Um, there is, in the end, there is no wrong or right. There are valid cases for a monolith as well as there are valid cases for a microservice. And we made the decision that the microservice architecture is right for us because we wanted to have this flexibility to change components, to change features, to change software, and still keep the whole thing running and don't have to cross the fingers that we don't tear them something down that's uh, connected. But what we learned in this phase when we defined our architecture, what you saw was a very, very high level. Um, in, the, in real, we started with a sheet of A2 paper and started drawing our, our R to B architecture. And um, we were quite good at the beginning what we, what we knew, what we identified. But um, we really, really soon realized neither IT nor business can define this architecture alone. Business can't do anything about um, IT, they, they have requirements. But IT can't define a target picture without the business requirements, without the understanding what needs to be done, what, what needs to be achieved. Um, so you have to sit together on one table, draw together on this sheet of paper what, should, what your target picture should look like and understand is this helping my business? Is this supporting my IT? Is this supporting my, uh, supporting my overall strategy or not? And if not, draw again. Um, there is no perfect IT setup. There is always a compromise. There were complaints about, from IT, there were complaints from mar uh, for marketing, there were complaints from business as well, because there is no IT setup that will support everything. You have to make a compromise between practicability, business support, complexity, and costs. And last but not least, architecture develops over time. I said we started drawing this, starting this project, 
uh, we were quite good. We had a lot of building blocks. We had a lot of lines of uh, how systems should be connected, how data flows. And in the end, we had to redraw it yeah, every week. We added there, we added there, we changed there and there um, because, but we knew this in the beginning, we had to fix the basics to be quite sure what we want to build and how it overall should look like. But um, in the end, you still have to realize that this, that you can't think of everything in the, uh, in the beginning and you have to make the base that is re re very, very solid and then you can adapt. But um, think twice about the base and then you can start. So what we thought, what a, was a good approach to do this, uh, we changed our organizational uh, setup. We have on this side this legacy deployment maintenance product team that is responsible for continuous product development and maintenance. So they keep on developing features, they keep on rolling out, they are responsible for maintenance, for keeping the systems healthy. And we set up a new stream that is fully Scrum based. Um, works with iteration, and they were responsible for building up this new microservice-based architecture and continuous integration. So we had combined streams on different locations with a back channel from the, from the new software to the old software, trying to reintegrate the new components and delete the old ones and hoping everything works. It looks good on the, this picture. Um, but it was really, really hard to achieve because um, you, you have to imagine it's hard to find developers, it's hard to find people that are senior enough to work with two different worlds because you do not need a, only need a senior product manager who understands both. You need senior staff on development, on UX and project management um, to understand this combined approach, to have this back channel and this force. Um, and you always have this back and forth between different development streams. So after we did set up this, we decided what uh, we want to do ourselves and what we want to buy. It's a quite classical approach. We started defining our building blocks like storefront, our bidding service, our sorting, our invoicing, our product information management system, content management and recos, and so on. And then we decide, define what is our core business, what makes us special, what, uh, what differs from market vendors, what differs from other players in the market, what is really unique for us, because what is unique needs to be done by ourselves or if it's not unique but crucial for our business and or for our strategy, we made this make or buy decision because you could argue why should the storefront be a um, self-built self solution when you can buy this. But we, from the strategy point, we said we want to have the fastest portal in the market and none of the players in the market was able to support this and so we decided even if it's not unique for, for the market, that this is a make decision. But for example, for the content management system, we said it's a, it's a buy decision because it's not our core business. We have no special needs there and we can buy it from a vendor. And we moved through every building block we defined what needs to be done ourselves, what needs to be uh, bought by a vendor. And so we um, decided where to go and how to go. And I, can, I cannot underestimate this because I know this from client side as from consultancy side as well. Always ask yourself, are you so special in this case? Because only why you, because you think you are special is not you are. This can always be the case that is valid to buy software that is ready to use, has a short time to market. And not only because it costs you, um, you can still do it because you are faster, you are maybe better, um, but you have a still faster time to market. And you always have to ask yourself, 
is it really necessary to build something on my own? Because building something on your own means maintaining on your own, not participating in product development and doing all the stuff yourself. If you want to, you can do this. If it's crucial to your business, do this. If it's not crucial, leave it to somebody who can and who wants, who gets paid for it and delivers good quality. And um, be 70 to 80% sure about your decision making. It is nothing help. It's not helping if you over evaluate something. Um, you will lose time. Uh, you will lose more time in over evaluating, like an, as an error costs you. Hmm? Ah. So, sounds like a valid project approach. We decided. We made some nice project decisions, some decision templates, set up the organizational and started the project. And this happened. We failed. And we failed big. This project was running over six months and delivered no valid output, no customer value in the end. We had to stop this project. Not because our, uh, IT, uh, our strategy was wrong, but we made it completely wrong. We, we went totally against the wall. Um, and afterwards, we had to analyze why we failed. There were five reasons we identified. The overall complexity uh, with two projects was just too much. It was never ending because we had two streams. We had a legacy system that was still being developed. So we, there were never enough pace to finish the, the project and to migrate all. Um, there was a remote project that was hard because people in India, people in Germany, people in Lithuania working together. Uh, it's, it's hard when you have one project, but if you have two projects, it, it does not get better. We had um, this continuous, devel uh, continuous development approach in the legacy system, and um, this leads to the point you're always behind with the new system. And in the end, business blocks, or business blocked the project, uh, because we, because of these four points uh, before, we, we were not able to finish the project, we were not able to deliver fast enough, and so, with good reason, they blocked the new project. And they were right. It was not good. So, in 2018, we completely stopped the project, uh, restarted, technical and organizational level. Uh, but I say technical and organizational, not strategy level. Strategy, we kept. We still wanted to be there. Microservice-based, flexible architecture. We wanted to have the benefits of this. But we knew now we had to go for another way to achieve this. But if you fail a project, you have to ask yourself, was it the wrong way you went, or was the target wrong? And we were quite sure our target was right, but we made it wrong. So what we did now is we changed completely the setup. We had this legacy system completely de-staffed, fewer people working on this. There was a nearly complete feature freeze on this old system. Only maintenance was done. And we built up a new three-team-based three uh, three uh, agile, uh, agile product unit that completely developed this project in a uh, Scrum-based process. Um, and there was no integration, this will lead to a big bang. So what we did, we took our legacy system and sliced a bit out where we want to migrate because we had diff legacies are different systems. So we sliced across system barriers because we defined this we want to change, the others can still keep running. And so we, we had this legacy scope, we had an MVP scope, um, well, I'm, not, I'm still not happy with this MVP, um, and we have a realized scope, because we defined the MVP before, and we realized we couldn't achieve it, so we still kept slicing out features within the project. Um, but what you have to learn, an MVP approach is not, does not fit a relaunch project. MVP means minimum viable product. This means throw away everything, start complete new, be ready after two months, and build from there but it does not fit when you already have this functionality. 
nobody in the business will accept it, nobody on sea level will accept it. So maybe rename it a bit, it's a minimum acceptable product, a minimum lovable product, but an MVP always has a problem the developer understands on, with an MVP com something completely different than a business stakeholder. So don't go into this lane, just name it right. What you want, what, how you want to name it and what you understand behind it. Big, big, big bang relaunches cause a lot of pain, but they cause less pain than a failed project. Nobody is happy, was happy uh, stopping this project, deciding that we completely failed. Um, and what you have to know if you have a big bang, the business will go havoc because we stopped feature development in the old system. This means six to seven months, nobody got its features. So you can imagine what happens if marketing, account management, sales, for seven months, they don't get any feature. They will, they will cry, they will escalate to sea level, so you have to manage the stakeholder. This is a crucial part because they can stop your project again. You have to explain them why it is right to, uh, to not do this right now, to not develop features, but to make a relaunch, a big bang relaunch, even if it's painful. You ha they have to understand that if, we, if you keep developing on an old code base, and if you keep on building up and up and up, you will have this big mountain of old stuff that you will never be able to migrate, never be able to understand, to maintain, you will never be future proven. They have to understand that it's right to don't get their features. So talk to them. And um, to keep it, um, to keep it in, in handable uh, chunks, slice your project at according barriers you see fit. This can be technical, like we did, this can be organizational, or where you see these barriers. So in the end, our strategy was fulfilled. We successfully relaunched our product. We made this project successful. Everybody is happy, most everybody is happy, because as you saw, we, don't real, we did not realize the whole MVP scope. Uh, so of course we had to slice some features out, but we talked to the people who, who were owner of this functionality, explained why they can't get it now. So we made, of course, this, a step back when we relaunched our product that um, there were now more manual processes that was not so highly automated. There were not so many functionalities and features, um, but they had to understand that it's still better than the old one because we achieved with the strategy a better performance, a mobile-first strategy, flexibility, all the things everybody wanted and everybody was happy to trade in some functionality and some comfort, fe comfort features to fit the strategy. But you have to make them understand why it's right. If you don't do this, they will, they will escalate again why it's not there. So this is how we look today and this is not the final the final step we want to take, they are, our roadmap is full, but if you want to take something with you from lessons learned, I already talked about the first to, um, to six, but seven and eight, um, have the balls to stop a project if you see it failing. If you are running against a wall, stop. We could have seen this failing project earlier, but we did not, re we did not react. We tried to rescue this project, and it was not successful. So if you see a project failing, have the balls to stop it. And this, the eight one, is quite nice. Always leave a note that you tried your best. This, this leads to the point that everything is a compromise between practicability, costs, timing. Of course, we did not everything right. We did a lot of compromises that were not perfect, that were where I know I would like to have it done another way, but we, did it, we did, still did it this way how we did it, because it was right to this timing. It's like a fix me note in the code, every developer knows this, and um, yeah, it's always easy if you look after two years um, into um, an existing project, why, and complain why is this done this way, why is this done that way, but if you do this leave, this, leave this information in the documentation why it was right, what, what was your considerations to this point, and why it should be fixed or how it can be fixed. 
Yes. Thank you very much. And I think I still have five minutes left if there are any questions. That's true. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, hey, I'm actually interested to understand how the product team at uh, Mobile is split uh, across the different business units. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to understand the setup of the product team uh, because I see your title, Head of Consumer and Apps, but this is more CPO-driven mm -hmm. role, uh, so I would like to understand how it's differentiated with, at uh, Mobile. Um, we we have set up this new project uh, product team in three teams to, uh, and two addition um, two additional not product related teams. There are two back end teams and one front end team. Uh, my team is uh, responsible for all the things that is front end related, um, all customer interaction, uh, mobile apps, web portal, uh, everything that the customer sees. And there are two back end teams. We sliced organizational. One is. Um, responsible for all the software that is needed to set up partner data, product data, millions of data. That's why we created an own team with a specific focus on product information management system because we saw that our product data is key business value and we have to have a different, uh, separate team for it. And another team is um, building all the functionality that is needed for invoicing, bidding, so to keep the partner happy. In the end, you can imagine we slice the team a bit around how the, um, the user flow and the partner flow is, so the front end part, the partner part, and the data part. This is how we set this up to, to, to make it happen. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just a quick question on, uh, on the transition from data. Uh, how did you manage to get uh, data from a mon monolithical thing which you don't want to touch mm -hmm. into this new microservice-based architecture? Because system is running, business yep. is running, so would be interesting to get some insights on that. Yep. Um, there you have to there you have to look into different data, types of data. Product data was quite easy because we got this new. Um, for example, partner data and uh, customer data are the par hard part. Uh, for example, for partner data, uh, it was a manual process. So we made an export of um, uh, of all partner data from Legacy and. A lot of people typing a lot of fields into this new backend uh, with this data. We, but, but this was right to this point. We decided against a migration path from old to new, um, knowing how the people would like this. Um, but we estimated that the migration path to build would cost us another 40 or 60 days. And so we decided it is cheaper and quicker to have this done manually with a lot of students um, to migrate manually. And one last question from the audience. Oh. Yeah. Sure. Just going to the point that you mentioned, have the balls to drop the project earlier. It's it's really hard. It's like it sounds easier to say that. Yeah, I but know. you have a lot of commitment to uh, the like different stakeholders, mm -hmm. the management team, and if I spend, which is something I'm facing at the moment, uh, four or five months on a project that's blocking mm -hmm. some development resources and coming to say, hey, we actually decided not to go with this. Yeah. Consequences probably long term for sure. It's clear what's better, but. How would you handle the whole situation here? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you. It's, it's hard. If it would be easy, we would have made it uh, earlier. So we, we had the same error like you're describing. We, we did not escalate it early enough. Um, but in the end, this stopping of a project cannot come out of the product of the development team or the migration team. It has to come from C or director level, um, from company lead. You have to escalate as a product owner, as a project manager, as a program manager to, to your director, to your C level, that you see this project failing 
you see you set the, the lightning to red because of this, this, this point, and then you can make a decision template why you would, what needs to be done to rescue this project, and if it cannot be rescued, there are projects that can't be rescued, you have to make a decision template that it's a good idea to, to stop it, but the actual stopping of a project cannot be done, it can only be done from sea level because we spend a lot of money on this. And the one who gives the money has to stop it again. Okay, thank it, you very I, much, it's Chris. Not, it's not nice to do this, to, to suggest to stop something that's running for six months. Thank you very much.